maybe let's get started. Yeah. Oh, hello. Hello, Andrew. <laughs> right. Okay. So, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining the uh, our talk, first talk today on the community track. And um, please let me introduce you to Merle Clance, who's our current ASF treasurer. Um, so she's going to talk to you about Treasury and all the exciting things that she has been involved in over the last year, I think, um, in uh, reforming how we, what, what we do and how we use our money. So that's really, really great. So um, please uh, extend a warm welcome to Merle. And uh, I'm sure it would be a really, really interesting talk for, for you all. If you have any questions, um, please uh, write them into the chat. And then uh, at the end of the presentation, um, Merle can go through and, uh, and, and respond to those. Because I know that you won't be able to actually sort of speak. <laughs> you won't be able to speak. But, yeah, um, but please use the chat for your questions. So thanks very much. Without any more, I shall uh, I'll pass it over to Merle. So off you go. Thank you, Sharon. So I'm really excited to talk to you all about this because this has been a lot of work over the last year and a half. And I'm really proud of some of the work we've done here. So what I'm going to be going through here. Um, for, uh, for this presentation. First, I'm gonna give y'all an overview of what operations at the ASF actually does. Uh, I know that that's not specifically part of Treasury, but I think you'll understand better what the changes we've made in Treasury mean for the Apache Software Foundation with that fresh in your minds. So you probably know all of that stuff, but we're gonna go through it anyways. Um, then we're going to talk about um, what the Treasurer actually does. So just as a quick overview here, what the Treasurer does is uh, takes the money in, puts the money out, um, stores the money, reports on the money coming in and the money coming out and the money being stored. And we also deal with uh, figuring out what tooling is appropriate to make all of that happen. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, how, it's, how, how we do it. And I'm also going to talk to you about how we changed it because we've changed a lot of things over the last year and a half. Um, so before I start with the presentation, let me introduce myself again. My name is Merle Kranz. I'm the treasurer for the Apache Software Foundation. I'm also senior engineering manager at Grafana Labs, uh, where I manage a small team of really excellent engineers working on the front end for, the, for our cloud products. So without further ado, let's talk a little bit about the treasury. So first off, what does the Apache Software Foundation do? I think everybody here knows this, but I think it's important to put it front and center. The Apache Software Foundation provides open source software for the public good. That is their mission. That is the goal that the Apache Software Foundation supports. And the way that the Apache Software Foundation reaches this goal or reaches for this goal is to support project communities. The um, A to Z, the, the Apache Arrow, Apache um, Cassandra, Apache Finneract, Apache PLC4X, and I'm not going to be able to list all of them because there are many of them. Um, we make it possible for our project communities to focus on the community and the code. Um, but how do we do that? Well, the Apache Software Foundation consists of, in addition to project communities, also um, operations. <clears throat> so what is operations? Operations includes a number of things. Now we're sitting right here at a conference. So it should be obvious that conferences is part of operations. Uh, where we organize and support the ability for project communities to come together and start and uh, continue conversations about uh, the work that they're doing in their projects. Um, another big one is infrastructure, where we provide uh, the necessary mailing lists, Git, uh, GitHub um, repos, um, website hosting and, and, and uh, that the foundation needs. We also provide marketing and PR. We provide legal support should projects need it. Hopefully they don't, but occasionally they do. We provide branding support. Um, there's a couple of things I didn't list here because not enough space. Um, we have a diversity and inclusion initiative. Um, we have, uh, we also have the travel assistance co uh, committee, which has been less active lately because of the coronavirus. Um, pandemic, but uh, when we start having in-person conferences, again, their work is also very important. So let's dig into that in a little bit more detail. What does infrastructure do? I'm not gonna say everything that infrastructure does, but 
I want to go over some of the things that cost money just to show you um, some of the, the touch points here. So I didn't mention already mailing lists and web hosting, um, identity and permissions, collaboration tools like source control, that would be Git or Subversion, um, Jira, Slack, all of these things require us to, uh, to, to manage them. We have systems administrators who support the projects in all of these various ways. Um, they, it also requires us sometimes to negotiate with um, vendors um, for web hosting, for example. Uh, and sometimes it requires us to um, make decisions about what kinds of, of tools we're going to offer our, our um, communities to scale them up, to scale them down. Another example to uh, pull out uh, another piece of operations that this one is, I think, going to be fairly understandable is conferences. So um, in normal times, whatever normal means, uh, we would have an in-person conference. In that case, we would need a hotel. Um, the hotel needs to be paid. In this case, we are having a virtual conference. The conference venue is Hopin. Hopin also needs to be paid. We do video sharing over YouTube. Um, if it were an in-person conference, we would have refreshments. Conferences have a lot of moving parts. And uh, because we're talking about physical services and physical space in many cases, and even when we aren't, we're talking about things, again, that cost money that need to be paid for. So how exactly do we do that? Well, we support operations with the treasury and with fundraising. And um, fundraising is entirely in operations. Treasury is partially, uh, part, is part of operations, but also part of governance. Um, so I'm not gonna dig into that too deeply. I just wanted to make sure I mention it here. Treasury and fundraising, well, they do what you think they do. Treasury keeps the money, fundraising makes sure the money comes in. Fundraising reaches out to sponsors. And I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about fundraising, but the work there is also important and interesting. Um, it's just that uh, I wouldn't have time to talk about fundraising and treasury. So I've given a high level overview already of what uh, the treasury does, but let's put it on the screen again. We have money out, we have money in, we have keeping track of the money, we have storing the money. Um, money out is called accounts payable and money in is called accounts receivable. Uh, this is, for some of you, this will be very basic, but some of you don't have much experience with this. And I just wanted to make sure we get the, the actual technical terms out there. Reporting includes things like board reporting. So saying how we're tracking against our budget, uh, how much money we have in our bank accounts. It also includes things like uh, submitting our tax forms on time. So the 990, um, or uh, at the beginning of the year, we also have to submit tax forms for, for some of our vendors. Um, and uh, we also uh, make decisions about and organize tooling so, uh, and services. So all of these pieces um, require uh, us to use various uh, tools and we have people helping us uh, to make all of this happen. I am not an accountant, the assistant treasurer is also not an accountant and proper accounting requires uh, people who know what they're doing. So I'm gonna focus in on each of these areas um, and explain what we do in each of these areas, how it works in each of these areas and what we have changed. Accounts payable. An example of an account payable might be the hop-in bill that we pay for this conference. Now, what we used to do for accounts payable, you might be wondering why Subversion is on this screen. Um, we used to, when a bill comes in, put it in a certain Subversion folder and then ask the officer who is in charge of that uh, particular budget to move that to an approved folder um, so that we could track the approval um, and we, so we could see in the history who did which, who approved which bills. And then we would pay the bill and then we would move that bill into paid. So the problem with this process, there, there are a number of problems with this process. Um, one of the problems with this process is uh, the person who lined up the bill for payment and paid the bill was the accountant. And our accountant, and in fact, most accountants, although they know, uh, they know their systems, they don't know subversion. Um, and it was very difficult for them to use this tool and use it properly. Um, 
another problem with the system was it made it very difficult to search for specific uh, specific uh, invoices. So if a vendor came along and said, you haven't paid us for XYZ, um, it was very difficult for us to go and say, oh, you're right, we haven't paid that, or actually we did, here it is. Um, so it wasn't optimized for a searchability because the contents of the invoices, the invoices were digital and the contents of the invoices weren't indexed in any way. So, and also what's further is um, Subversion doesn't check our bank accounts. So if we're going to say we need to pay that, we can't really say, do we have enough money in the account for it? Um, this hasn't been a problem uh, ever, but uh, typically you should make sure you have enough money in your account before you start paying bills. So we kicked a subversion out and we replaced it with a tool um, called bill.com. And uh, what bill.com does, it's, uh, it does basically it does approvals and it also links into, uh, into the bank via um, various options, um, wire transfer, ACH, or a couple of the options. It links to the bank and actually makes the payment for you. So you don't have to, have to go to the bank's online interface to um, line up payments. And what's more is it uh, links into the, the um, accounting software, QuickBooks, um, and uh, syncs that data over. So it reduces the manual toil and uh, also makes sure that approvals are correct. Um, and it makes it much easier to see them so you can actually see them in a UI instead of um, using subversion commands to, to discover that. And it's something that accountants can use. So we... Uh, lowered our error rate um, with paying invoices by introducing bill.com and uh, made it much, much easier for volunteers to do approvals. So we want, because all of the officers are volunteers, we want to uh, lower the toil that they have with uh, accounting as much as possible. And that's also the reason that we introduced RAMP. So in the past, we had done credit cards directly with our bank and um, what that meant was everybody had a plastic credit card um, and not very many people had credit cards, um, only the president and a couple of other officers. And what that also meant was that if a volunteer was making a one-off payment, let's say somebody was ordering swag for the conference, uh, that person would frequently pay out of their own bank account and then submit an invoice to be reimbursed for that. Well, our volunteers are already working for free. They're not being paid for the work they do for us. And it didn't seem right to me that they should be fronting the, the foundation money. Um, and at the same time, uh, it was very difficult to track approvals um, in this credit card system. It was very difficult to, be, to, to ensure that, um, that vendors weren't accidentally double charging us, for example, because they already had the credit card number. They could basically just take money out of our accounts. So what we did was we introduced a service called Ramp that makes it possible to issue virtual credit cards, which covers most of our cases since we're a mostly virtual organization. Um, we can now issue credit cards to volunteers for specific cases, and they can then um, set the limit so that only so that that vendor can only book a certain amount of money. And what that also means is that we can enable a wider range of volunteers. So um, those were important improvements and they were a lot of work to get into place. Um, they required just a lot of data entry, getting our vendors in line and um, ramp specifically required something else too, which I'll also be getting back to um, later in the presentation. The next part that I would like to talk about that we changed um, is our actual bank account. So we have uh, a number of solutions in, in uh, place for storing our money. We have about, currently, we have about $4 million um, in the bank. Uh, not all of that is in Citizens Bank where our primary banking relationship is. Some of that is in Boston Private in the form of CDARS, um, which means that it's FDIC insured. That means that um, if the bank goes down, we don't lose our money. It's a very, very safe investment strategy with a very, very low interest rate. Um, we found that uh, Citizens Bank was, uh, it was no problem um, working together with Bill.com, but we couldn't make it work with RAMP because RAMP required APIs that Citizens Bank didn't implement. So we replaced, we still have the Citizens account, but we replaced our primary banking relationship with a new bank, TD Bank. Um, so we have started uh, doing all of our vendor payments, all of our sponsor payment receiving um, to the TD bank account. 
Uh, and uh, the, the benefit has been um, most primarily that, that we can work with RAMP now. So what else do we do? Well, we do tooling and services. And that some of the, the pieces that I've talked about already are tooling, um, but let's also talk about the account, the general accounting tooling and the, and the services that we have. Because we are not accountants, we're programmers. Uh, we employ an accountant to do um, our accounting, to maintain our books, to, uh, to make sure that vendors are being paid, um, to do soft collections for fundraising. So basically reach out to uh, vendors, um, send them their invoices, uh, interface with, with vendor invoicing systems. Because we wanted to move towards more software as a service systems, um, we needed to replace our existing relationship. Uh, Virtual did a wonderful job uh, at the beginning, getting our uh, accounting books um, lined up when, when we first employed Virtual. We hadn't been doing it at all properly, and they needed to spend a great deal of time to straighten things out. That was back in 2013. That was before I was treasurer. Um, they did uh, really wonderful work uh, straightening things up, but we needed to move to the next level. So we employed a new um, accountant, Ignite Spot, who uh, have uh, close relationships with um, Intuit and uh, could work with us also with uh, the other software as a service tools that we wanted to, to uh, implement. We also replaced QuickBooks Enterprise, which is a desktop solution um, with QuickBooks Online. And the advantage to this is that it integrates very, very smoothly with the other software as a service solutions that we're, that we're using, build.com and ramp um, specifically. Uh, it also integrates well with our banks um, and uh, if we, for whatever reason, needed to change accountants again, we wouldn't need to do anything with our data. Our data is already there. It's um, as a service, it belongs to us. Um, we would just uh, provision access to a new set of people. Also, if we change treasures, same thing. Um, we would just need to take away my access and give somebody else access. So those are the things that we've changed around tooling and services. Um, Reporting, we haven't changed that much, but we have changed a little bit. Um, previously, when we were uh, creating the board reports, we would use Apache Whimsy. So um, we would export from QuickBooks an Excel sheet that had contained a great deal of data. Um, the accountant would fine tune that um, to make sure that it was presentable. And then I would upload that to Whimsy and Whimsy would then extract a text report out of that that would then land in the board report. Now, what I've done is um, removed the numbers from our monthly board reporting, kept the numbers in our quarterly and annual board reports, and thus removed the need for Apache Whimsy. And again, because we're using a software as a service solution, we can create the board reports as PDFs with a tool that is made to make really beautiful and useful um, board reports uh, or account uh, financial reports. Um, it can do actually a lot more than we're already using it for. And I look forward to uh, us further exploring the options, for example, and creating officer reports um, where currently we're, all we're doing is creating reports for just the board. So we have made improvements in accounts payable, in tooling and services, in our banking solutions and reporting. Um, we haven't done much with accounts receivable. Uh, we continue to serve uh, fundraising. We continue to uh, do soft collections um, in that context. Uh, fundraising is, uh, as the, the picture here sort of implies, uh, they create the fuel, they bring in the fuel that the foundation runs on. And again, just to bring it back, because we need to keep the mission of the foundation in focus. The goal of all of this is to provide open source software for the public good. So yes, we're doing um, a lot of uh, back end back end stuff, back office stuff. Um, but we're doing it in order to enable our communities. We're enabling our communities so that y'all can provide open source software for the public good. And what that means is, uh, in the context of money at least, there are also a lot of uh, organizations that want to help us out because they benefit from it, because they see the societal benefit in it. Um, so I wanted to, to thank also our platinum sponsors um, here. I can't, I'm not gonna list all of them, but, um, these are the organizations that make it possible for us to support you 
So I want to thank you. So let's see if there are any questions. Anybody? Hi, Johan. Hi, Craig. You're very welcome for the presentation. Give you all a couple of seconds. Maybe you, maybe something occurs. A couple more people have come in since I started. That's great. Ah, so Craig wants to understand fundraising operations more. Um, Craig, was there something specific that you wanted to know? Uh, I do, in fact, have, have ideas about how to automate fundraising better, but um, it's uh, not in my role. So I feel like I would be um, impinging on the fundraising folks if I start throwing suggestions over the, the wall here. I mean, there, well, I will say one thing. Um, we don't currently employ a CRM tool. Um, we haven't needed it up until now because uh, the number of sponsors hasn't been quite that large. Um, CRM stands for Customer Relationship Management. Um, I do think that in the future, we need to move in that direction just to also improve the interface with the treasurer uh, so that we can see a little bit more like what's coming uh, down the road and uh, also, uh, I think the, that uh, it would allow us to interact with sponsors in a better way. Current pain points. So um, one current pain point that I have right now is a citizen's bank account. Um, I am currently working towards, uh, towards closing that account uh, because we don't need it. Um, another current pain point that I have um, is with the, the Boston private account. They recently merged with the Silicon Valley Bank and they are discontinuing the CDARS product. So I need to find a new solution uh, for uh, protecting our money um, while, uh, yeah, um, while we're not using it um, and to make sure that uh, it's both safe and accessible. Let me see, any other pain points? Oh, uh, I touched one recently, uh, briefly. Um, I'll get to the... the conference in a moment. Um, I, I touched one, one pain point briefly, and that is reporting. So um, we use the, the, the data in QuickBooks to uh, determine, are we staying in budget and also to make future budgets. Uh, however, we provide kind of a rough overview to the board. Um, the, the officers only see it as it passes by them as a, one expense at a time. They don't ever get an overview of their areas. And I would like to start providing reports to the officers so that they can see in the last month, I spent this much money on these things um, and get a, a more of a big picture of their specific areas. Let's see, Johan said, is the virtual conference more costly for Apache or is in-person conference more expensive? In-person conferences are much more expensive for Apache. Virtual conferences are actually quite a bit less expensive which kind of makes sense because you can imagine that um, if somebody builds a building and rents it to you, um, that they're going to want to bring in some of the cost of building it and some of the cost of that land, whereas virtual space is well, not exactly infinite, but certainly more plentiful than, than physical space. Um, it's also uh, the case that when you're doing in-person conferences, you have to figure out uh, how much uh, in the in the form of like refreshments and human needs you're going to cover. Also, um, and this sounds weird, but it's true, in physical conferences, um, it can be more difficult to uh, to stream out talks. So um, in a virtual conference, the talks are just automatically recorded. But in a virtual conference, you have to hire a cameraman um, and possibly pay uh, 
ridiculous prices for bandwidth in order to um, bring talks out into YouTube or, uh, I mean, most people would like to see them live, but it's probably not going to happen, um, or bring them out after the conference. Any more questions? There, um, Johan asks if there are, if I'm in contact with other open source foundation treasures. There actually is a, um, a mailing list that uh, people from various foundations, calls the foundations mailing list, um, do collect. Um, and sometimes people ask questions like basically, how have you solved this problem or how have you solved that problem? Um, we are one of the biggest foundations out there. We probably have some of the most sophisticated needs, not quite like I think CNCF has uh, more sophisticated needs than ours. Um, but we do have more sophisticated needs than most of the smaller open source foundations out there. Um, so uh, we, yeah, we do talk about things uh, on that list and uh, share tips and tricks. Good question, Yuan. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, I'm sorry. Any more questions? Ah, good. Yuan tells me that I am actually pronouncing his name correctly and this makes me happy. Johan asks, um, is there a term for the treasure? And the answer is no, there isn't. Um, we, uh, I will remain treasurer until the board uh, removes me or until I decide to leave. Uh, and given the fact that there's not a huge number of people who seem to be very interested in becoming treasurer, uh, that will probably first happen when I decide to leave. However, um, one of my goals in this talk is to create a greater understanding of what the treasurer role is um, in order to improve the, the volunteer pipeline behind me because I don't think that it's good for the foundation if I'm the only person doing this. Um, and in that context, I noticed Craig Russell is in the audience uh, who is the assistant treasurer. Um, we also have another assistant treasurer, Trevor. Um, and I want to thank both of them also for volunteering uh, in their roles. Yeah, and you have a lot of good questions today. Does anybody have any more questions? Johan asks how much time it takes. So that varies actually quite a bit. Um, the, the minimum that it takes is about uh, two to three hours a week. So I have a half an hour meeting on Monday with the accountant um, and with the assistant treasurer and with a couple of other stakeholders. And uh, I spend about an hour going through making sure that the bills have been paid. Um, once a month, there's a board report to be done and I need to uh, keep track of the, various, uh, of the various reports that need to go out in the various directions. Um, when I'm changing something though, it can be a lot more. And this is one of the reasons why some of the need for the, uh, the change had sort of backed up. We had a lot of things that needed to be done that hadn't been done. Um, so uh, for example, introducing bill.com, that probably took me, I don't know exactly, but I'm getting a guess like 30 or 40 hours of work um, just to get that uh, moving and get all of the officers onboarded onto it, all of the vendors onboarded onto it. Um, various test payments made to make sure that we didn't accidentally miss a payment um, to, especially to our infra guys. Um, I really don't want to end up in a situation where they're not paid because we made a mistake. Um, so that was actually, that took a, a lot of time. Um, and the, the transition to a new um, accountant also took a lot of time. So the baseline, I don't know, two to three hours uh, a week, but uh, these each of these projects has been a project all by itself, um, some of them quite time consuming. 
Any more questions? Craig Hunt asks, are infrastructure employees employees or contractors? Um, so that varies. Um, we have, uh, some of them are, are uh, direct contractors. Some of them we employ through uh, what's called a PEO, um, Personnel Employment Organization, um, called the, the specific one that we use is called ADP Source, um, which means that they are employed by ADP Source on our behalf. And then we pay them money that they then pass on to our employees. I consider those uh, direct employees of the foundation. Um, it's not an uncommon way to employ people um, in, uh, if, if you're a small organization. Um, but uh, I also, frankly, I consider our contractors our employees too. Um, I, there's, there's two ways to treat contractors. There's people who are just temporarily there and people who you want to have a long-term uh, relationship with. And in the case of our infrastructure employees, I very much see them as employees that we need to take care of um, and make sure that they're... Um, that, that, yeah, I, I see them as employees um, in, in, in the sense of our responsibility towards them. Um, Sean asks, how many employees or contractors are currently on the payroll? Uh, so it, like employees through PEO is three, um, contractors, uh, let me think. I think it's five, six. I just, just notice one more. Um, yeah. So um, it there's it's it's kind of a question of who you count um, because some of the people who work for us as contractors um, outside of infra uh, don't work just on our work. So for example, um, in Ignite Spot, we have uh, depending we have two or three people who work on our uh, work, but they don't just work on our work. So I'm not really sure how to count those people. Um, Craig Hunt asks, so most have been on board for years. If you're talking about the infrastructure employees, a lot of them have been on board for years. Uh, not all of them. We have like um, in 2019, I think we hired two new guys. Uh, I guess that's still years. Yeah, yes, most of our infrastructure employees have been on board for years. Drew, welcome, <laughs> the new guy. Uh, at almost three years is the new guy. <laughs> Yuan, you're very welcome. I, uh, it was a pleasure doing it. Right, uh, Drew Folks uh, points out that we have a technical writer who has been uh, doing excellent work. I'm not sure when she started. When did she start? Or he start? When did he start? Ah, Andrew has been with the foundation a while on the Royale projects. But has been working with Infra for the last two years, says Dave Fisher. So. So Craig, when you say um, you may do some volunteer work on that front, do you mean an infra or do you mean a treasury now? It's a good area to, to help out in. Yeah. 
infrastructure is a good area to help out in, I mean. This is actually quite a weird way to interact with people. You're very welcome. I think um, we've run out of questions, so I'm gonna wrap it up here. Uh, I really enjoyed talking to y'all. Um, and if you have any questions offline, you can um, reach out to me. My Apache email address is merle at apache.org uh, or reach out to me on Twitter. Likewise, uh, you can see my Twitter handle there, um, at Merle Kranz. Um, and uh, see you around. <laughs>